Yeah. Yeah. I've heard of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've seen the polls, but I didn't know, you know, it was a big thing. Apparently more so in Europe, she said. Yeah. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's guest was referred to me by a previous guest, which is what happened so much with this show, which I appreciate very much. You might remember JL Fields, the adorable plant-based chef. She's been on several times. She's got a bunch of great books and she's got a great look. I love the way she looks. I love her hair. I love her tattoos. She said, you guys must meet. And the person she's referring to is today's guest. She's also a wonderful plant-fueled athlete. Her name is Sharon McDowell Larson. And please welcome her to the show. It's very nice to meet you. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be on. Right. So, you know, one of the things that our guests love to uh, to talk about and, and our audience likes to know is what your story is. What brought you to plant-based? Oh, um, yeah. So I've always been interested in nutrition and health. Um, you know, my mother died of cancer when I was mm-hmm. quite young. And so that kind of got me keenly interested in nutrition and, and how that impacts our health. And uh, so that was, yeah, I was a teenager uh, when I started looking into that. And, uh, but at the time I was mostly vegetarian and uh, I still remember I was on a bike ride with a a guy that I coached, he's he's a big endurance athlete. And he said, hey, you should read this book called The China Study. And I was like, oh, okay, that sounds interesting. And of course, being, being an athlete, you think, oh, I know everything there is to know about nutrition. And um, and I got into that book and um, realized that perhaps I really didn't know as much as I thought I did, particularly the dairy and the cancer link, because um, I was a big, you know, cheese lover and milk lover. And um, <clears throat> so I went through the book. I was very skeptical at first, but the research was just compelling. And I, and I looked at, you know, I was even looking up their studies and looking at the references and reading the papers. And finally, it was just like, no, it's, it's too compelling and uh, because of that cancer link to my mom, um, I went home to my husband. I said, hey, honey, we're, we're going to quit the, the cheese and the milk. And, and thankfully, he was supportive of that. And I tell you, um, it made such a difference in terms of my own personal health, as well as my um, just being able to perform as an athlete. So uh, it was really amazing. Uh, it's amazing how the China study was the point of entry for so many people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think what I really appreciated about the China study was its focus on evidence-based and the studies and the research. And it's not an easy read. Um, not at all. I had to get it on DVD, <laughs> yeah. uh, not DVD, yeah. a CD at the time. Now it's probably on Audible yeah. because it really isn't. It's it's yeah. above my pay grade, as they say. I'm so happy that your husband decided to join you because I, I talk so many people I talk to just their 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 spouses that will not get on board. Yeah, yeah, he's been great. So, yeah. So what kind of athlete were you that this diet helped fuel? So at the time I was a, I was racing as a professional mountain biker. Um, I wasn't good enough to quit my day job, but I was, I was racing in the pro field in Colorado, uh, mostly as a regional, regional kind of racing. And one of the things that I was really struggling with was um, <clears throat> I had some really bad lung issues, like, and I was diagnosed with exercise induced asthma. And so this kept getting worse and worse and they kept piling on the medications and more medications. And finally I was on three medications, two inhalers and another medication. And, um, and it, was, it was just a struggle to get through a race or get through a hard training session. And after, you know, I, I originally changed my diet to really be more healthy because I wanted to reduce my risk for heart disease and cancer and that stuff. And, and as it turned out, it was also good for my athletic career because A, it allowed me to lose weight, a little bit of weight. Uh, my cholesterol was also quite high at the time. My cholesterol dropped and my exercise induced asthma completely cleared up. Um, so I'm no longer on, on any medications for that. It's, and, it, and so that was really what made the difference for me. And so, um, you know, in my, in my day job, I work with I, or I used to work with senior executives on their health and fitness. So that was my day job at the Center for Creative Leadership. And so I really got into the nutrition research around um, you know, nutrition, its impact to long-term health and chronic conditions. And, um, and so I, you know, I was steeped in that data. Uh, and then I, you know, I was also interested in the sports nutrition side of things as well. 
And so when I looked at the sports nutrition side of things, it was very one-sided. Like you either were a sports nutritionist, no relationship to health, long-term health outcomes, or you were more in the nutrition and chronic disease. And there wasn't a lot of crossover for those two. And, and so what I started to do was, you know, started working on this book um, on, on being a plant-based athlete and why I think that can support and sustain long-term performance as an endurance athlete. And so I tried to blend those two worlds uh, together. So that, that's a little bit of my background. <laughs> okay, so are you, are you currently writing the book? It's not out yet, is it? No, it's not out yet. I'm, I actually finished the first rough draft. So um, I, I need to polish it up and, and, uh, and, and find, a, find a publisher, but it's, 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 I would say it's 80%, 80% done. Wow, that's great. Do you have a title yet? Uh, well, the working title is the way of the plant-based athlete, plant-fueled athlete. Um, but yeah, I'm still playing with that. So I'm not. I'm not well, you can always self-publish. That's what I did. In, in, <laughs> I might try that as well. Yeah, no. yeah. So what current sports nutrition research and recommendations, what are they and why aren't they serving athletes? Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's really been some, some great well done research on looking at, for example, carbohydrate needs of athletes, right? And, um, and also, you know, what are the protein needs? But, but the, the, the issue that I had with so much of that research is it's very, very reductionist. So they're looking at these macros, the macro makeup of the diet um, without sort of paying attention to the long-term health, health consequences of what they're recommending. And so we do know that proteins, uh, we do know that athletes need a little bit more protein. Um, and then they say, well, we, they need protein, chicken has protein, therefore you need to consume chicken. That's the recommendation. So it's a little bit short-sighted and it's, and, and again, very reductionist in nature and, and no consideration is given to the long-term impact of, of what they recommend. Um, so th that was probably the biggest issue that I had with it. Um, you know, the, the other issue is that, you know, it's very, athletes are very susceptible to fads as well. And, and if they, you know, if they think anything's going to improve their performance, if they thought eating horse urine or drinking horse urine would improve their performance, they would do it. Um, and, and so they're very susceptible to, to stories um, of like keto diets or whatever to improve performance. And, and so, um, so that was part of the incentive for, for writing the book. Yeah. Nice. So we have a question from Anita who's watching live because you mentioned this word, which is a word that Colin Campbell often uses. She goes, what does reductionist mean? Yeah, good question. So it's really looking at isolated nutrients. And so uh, by isolated, particularly in the sports and nutrition field, isolated nutrients is looking at just carbohydrates. And we know carbohydrates are critically important for an endurance athlete in terms of their performance. And I, and I can get into why, uh, but then they don't really consider the quality of those carbohydrates, right? Um, so we know, for example, protein. So there's so much research looking at protein and, and something called muscle protein synthesis. And we know that's important for athletes, but then they say, okay, you need more protein, but you know, and chicken has protein, therefore eat chicken or beef has protein, eat lean beef. Um, and, and, and so that's, you know, that's reductionism. And it's also spawned the you know, supplement business as well. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that eating plant-based boosts athletic performance? Ah, <laughs> there's, there's the question. Question of the day. Um, yes and no. So uh, if we look at the studies, um, some studies show a benefit, other studies don't. But the problem is that there's only been a handful of studies that have done, have been done. And some of the studies have taken omnivore athletes and had them switch to a plant-based diet for X number of weeks and measured different indices of performance and don't necessarily show a benefit. And these usually are in young athletes, you know, and sometimes, you know, I always say that when you're young and if you eat enough calories and have enough talent, you can pretty much eat any diet and still perform well. And we see that all the time. So part of my, you know, how I think about it is a, a couple ways. Um, so I'm, I'm an aging athlete, I'm 61 years old and, um, my goal is to continue to perform and compete into my 60s and 70s and 80s, right? And so when we look at 
the health side of the data, you know, in order for me to be able to do that, I need to be at the best possible health that I can be. And we know from the health uh, chronic disease data, uh, scientific data, that when we eat a plant-based diet, we don't get heart disease, we don't get diabetes, we don't get cancer, or we have reduced, dramatically reduced risk of getting cancers. So, so that I think helps. I mean, the other piece of it too, is that as athletes, um, you know, we constantly stress our bodies. You know, what we're doing is not necessarily healthy, you know? Um, and so we're stressing our immune systems const constantly. We're stressing our muscular systems. We're stressing our cardiovascular system. And, and so if we're eating a diet that doesn't heal, that doesn't support, that doesn't reduce oxidative stress, um, all of these things and inflammation, then um, it's, it's not going to serve us. So that, that's sort of a, a, a backdoor answer to the question that I, yes, I believe it can over the long run, uh, but so many of the studies that, you know, some studies show benefit, others don't. Most of those are just short-term studies. Yeah. Yeah. But did you, I'm sure you saw the movie Game Changers. Uh, yes. I, I actually uh, have had conversations with, um, with James Wilkes in the movie, and he actually sent me a link many months out before, and I got to get a sneak preview of that. But yes, um, I, I thought that was a fantastic, uh, fantastic movie. Yep. Do you think it changed the minds of any athletes? Oh, I know athletes that it's changed their minds. Um, and, and it was very compelling and very well done. And, and, and uh, yeah, and, so, and I think some athletes have sort of shifted in that direction. Some athletes have gone plant exclusive. Um, but yeah, I think, it, I think it's had an impact for sure. And, and the, yeah. yeah, the predominant view in athletics is like protein, more, better. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I come from the endurance world. And when you look at the, the studies on endurance athletes, basically they're saying, um, you know, most of them get too much protein. Um, and where they're lacking is, is carbohydrates. And when we look at sort of performance and performance outcomes, um, over and over again, the studies show that if you can eat a high carbohydrate diet, that's where you're going to see the performance benefits as opposed to eating a high fat or a high protein diet. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it's interesting um, in, in terms of some of the descriptions of, you know, when they talk about in, in some of the papers, they talk about a plant-based diet and they say, well, you know, you have to really be careful about this diet and you have to make sure that, you know, you're, you're, you're doing it right. Um, but when you actually do comparisons between the two groups, you actually find that the plant-based diets do far better in terms of getting enough nutrients for the athletes, getting enough protein, eating less saturated fat, um, much more high quality diet. So the perceptions are very different from, from reality for sure. Yeah. Well, I like what you said that some athletes succeed not because of their diet, but in spite of it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. There's lots of things that go into being a good athlete and performing well. Uh, but certainly I think over the long term, uh, diet's going to, it's going to give you a leg up. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a YouTube channel and I watched all the videos because there's not that many yet. So that's why I was able to do it. Just so you know, <laughs> I did that on my yep. channel. There's like a thousand. I don't think that would be possible for most people, but you talked a lot about keto diets and do the, is there any evidence that those boost athletic performance? And is that something that a lot of athletes are interested in these days? Yeah, more and more so. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, and that's a, it's a very interesting idea that you can retool the ability of your muscle or your, your metabolism to be able to burn more fat during exercise. Um, and so that's been demonstrated on a keto diet when athletes do a keto diet. Um, however, um, the problem is that being able to burn more fat doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna be faster, right? Um, so <clears throat> I, I understand why it's appealing, particularly to endurance athletes, particularly to ultra endurance athletes. Uh, the, the thinking is, well, if I can burn more fat during my exercise, that's going to benefit me. Um, the problem is that it takes more oxygen to be able to burn more fat. And so you're just less economical as an athlete. Um, and if you want to do high intensity exercise, Absolutely not. You need, you need glycogen, you need glucose to do that. And when people do a keto diet, their ability to perform high intensity exercise actually goes down, is reduced. Um, and so uh, 
you know, it, it, it's a, uh, when, you know, they to date, I mean, there's been studies comparing performance outcomes on people on a traditional diet or a higher carbohydrate diet to a keto diet. And so far, not a single study has shown performance benefit and many show a performance decrement uh, in terms of, uh, of that diet. Um, so yeah, there's just no evidence for it, but yet people keep jumping on the, jumping on the wagon. Uh, I just don't understand, especially somebody that's like a runner, how they would fuel themselves on fat and meat. It doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. Um, but you know, the stories are out there. And so they're, they're oftentimes what people do, um, is go on the keto diet, get what they call fat adapted. And then when they have a race coming up, then they'll re refuel with carbohydrate and they think, oh, I have the best of both worlds. Uh, but the problem, of course, is that when you consistently do that, you downregulate your ability to, to use glucose for high intensity exercise. Uh, you downregulate that, that uh, aerobic glycolysis pathway. And, and unfortunately, it, it doesn't help performance. But, you know, like people, people swear by it and stories are powerful. And, and many times, you know, People would rather believe one story than 10 studies. So. <laughs> wow. I love that. People would rather believe one story than 10 studies. That's so true. What about immune function in athletes? Because a, a few of the people I know that were plant-based and got COVID were like marathon runners. Like, doesn't that somehow, well, I'll let you answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, this was actually a lot of my research in grad school I was looking at the impact of exercise and particularly strenuous exercise on the immune function. And, and so over the years, this, is, this has been somewhat debated in terms of, um, you know, it, we know for sure that very strenuous sustained exercises, exercise causes perturbations or some negative outcomes with, with the immune function. Um, but diet or carbohydrate intake can affect that. So if you, if you go out and you do a, a 15 mile run, and you only drink water, or you don't take any carbohydrates in, then um, you, you actually hurt the immune function, you suppress uh, some of the markers of immune function like IgA or interferon or uh, whatever, you, the inflammation markers actually go through the roof. Um, and so, yes, um, and, and, and the other thing is that the, the white blood cells which make up the immune system, they need glucose to run just like red blood cells. Red blood, red blood cells only use glucose for energy. And the white blood cells only, you know, they, they use predominantly, again, glucose for energy. So if you're depriving them of that substrate, then they're just not gonna function as well. Um, and so absolutely, I think not just, not just eating more carbohydrates, but eating, you know, nutrient rich fruits and vegetables, whole grains, um, improving gut health, all of those then can contribute to improve immune function. And like I said, you know, athletes are on the razor's edge all the time. They're pushing the limits um, and stressing their bodies constantly. And uh, if you don't support them, including, you know, hurting, compromising perhaps immune function. Um, and so, you know, the, from that perspective, I think diet can make a significant difference. Yep. Yeah. What about weight management in athletes? Is that something that? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, it's physics, right? So if you can be lighter, uh, carry less weight around or less body fat, more muscle, um, then your performance is likely going to be better, uh, particularly if there's an uphill component to that. So I live in Colorado and as a mountain biker, when I first started racing pro, this was before I changed my diet, I thought, oh, um, I, I could be faster going up those mountain trails if I could drop some, some weight. And I noticed that, you know, I was starting to get into my forties and I thought, well, it just got harder and harder. And so I started restricting portions and counting calories. And, and it was just, a, you know, completely frustrating because I was hungry all the time <laughs> and cranky and, uh, and, and, and it didn't, it, the weight didn't come off like I thought it should given my level of physical activity. I mean, I was training 15 hours a week. And, um, and so there's some interesting research out of, um, by Ponser at all, who, you know, they, they looked at a tribe in Africa called the Hadza. And the Hadza are hunter gatherers. Um, they probably get most of the calories from gathering more than hunting, but 
a uh, very traditional um, hunter-gatherer lifestyle. So they're moving constantly. They're not sitting at desks, you know. But, you know, I don't mean to interrupt you, but you're moving constantly. I noticed that you're, <laughs> you're kind of remind, you kind of remind me of Dr. Gregor on the treadmill. Like that's how you probably get your, your movement in all day, huh? I can't sit still. Sorry. I hope, hopefully it's not distracting. Let me know if it's distracting. <laughs> I just yeah. had to mention that when you talked about <laughs> moving constantly, I'm like, well, this lady gets it because she moves constantly. Yeah. I, I don't like to sit long. Um, yeah. So they, they, they use some very sophisticated techniques to measure their caloric output, right? So there's something called uh, 24 hour energy expenditure. So they measured how many calories they expend over a 24 hour period and then they used, then they compared that to an age matched group in Europe and people that were working in offices, sitting at desks. And surprise, surprise, the total calories expended was exactly the same. So this was sort of like, you know, earth shattering a little bit because our traditional model of thinking about exercise and weight loss is that you know, we have the thermic effect of food, we have our metabolism, you know, and then we have exercise. And the more exercise we do, it's linear, correct? So the more exercise we do, the more calories we expend, therefore the more calories we can consume. So this, this whole finding that these the calories that were being expended were similar was a little bit earth shattering because the Hudza were were exercising all day long and the people in Europe were sitting most of the day. And so they said, why is this? Um, so it had nothing to do with efficiency. And, and what they think is that it's called the conserver model of energy expenditure, that as we exercise more, we conserve energy in other ways, such that it's a curvilinear relationship, not a linear relationship. And so the challenge that many athletes have with losing weight is that they think, okay, I just ran 20 miles, that I burned about 2000 calories, uh, my metabolism about 1000 calories, so I can eat 3000 calories uh, to make up for that deficit. Well, it's not that simple, right? And so it's probably, yeah, we, you know, as athletes, we, we probably do burn more calories than most people, but it's just not linear. The math just doesn't work that way. And I think that's one of the reasons why when I was trying to lose weight, counting my exercise calories, my intake calories, it was just an exercise in frustration. And so, um, you know, the same rules apply that you talk about all the time in terms of calorie density. And that's exactly what I did. Um, when I switched to eating more whole foods, less processed foods, less calorie concentrated foods, I was eating until I was full and you know, almost dropped 10 pounds in the first three months without even trying. So, um, so that's, you know, I, I do have a chapter in the book where I talk about weight loss for athletes and, and kind of, you know, many athletes are, are, are trying to get as lean as possible for their performance reasons. Um, and that's, that's, that's the way to do it. Um, it's not by uh, increasing your activity level necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. When you mentioned Ponzer, Pons, Ponsner, Ponzer, Ponzer, P-O-N-T-Z-E-R. Okay. So isn't that the the person that did what's called the exercise paradox that was in uh, Scientific American or yeah. one of those journals? I, I, I bought I bought that article okay. and I read it because I remember Dr. Doug Lyle was was saying that in that article, it's, it's not to say we shouldn't exercise. Of course, yeah. we should for a variety of reasons, but weight loss isn't one of them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's still kind of like, when I first read it, I was like, how do I get my head around this? Um, because that's our thinking. It's the additive model, right? The more I exercise, the more I get to eat. Um, and, and it unfortunately doesn't work. That way. <laughs> yeah. like, you know, and I think there's exceptions. So, you know, I think that if you're training for the Tour de France or you're training for an Ironman triathlon, um, you know, there's only so, so much that you can conserve. Um, and so, yeah, you do need more calories, but probably not as many as we, we would like to think. Yeah. Right. Well, they say, you know, you can't outrun your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are there certain foods that fuel athletic performance? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm very much, uh, uh, you know, advocate for, for a, a, a high, you know, foods that are rich in carbohydrates. 
Um, and this has been shown over and over again in the research that endurance athletes in particular, that's where they thrive. That's what they need to, to be able to perform. And the, the intake of carbohydrates is in most athletes is insufficient. Um, and so fruits, whole grains, potatoes, root vegetables, uh, those starchy foods um, is, is so critical. And if, you know, I, there's recommendations around um, carbohydrate intake for athletes of different levels, right? So if you're, if you're a, 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 you know, if you're training hard and a training a lot of hours a week, like above 15 hours a week or 10 hours a week, then um, if you look at the recommendations, I, I converted it into bananas, right? So you need to, if you're a high, high performance athlete, you need to consume about 34 bananas a day just to get enough carbohydrates. Um, so it's, it's, it's typically more than most athletes think. And, and, and I, you know, I coach athletes, I work with them. I had one guy that I'm working with right now. He, you know, he eats a really healthy diet and, uh, he, you know, I had to look at his, his intake and it's like, nope, you're eating too much protein, even as a plant-based athlete, too much protein, not enough carbohydrate. Um, so all of those carbohydrate rich foods are, are critically important, uh, for performance and just immune function and everything. Yeah. Uh, uh, Patty says you look great for 61. I'm going to be 61 in like two weeks, not looking forward to it. So <laughs> were you born in 1960? Yes. I figured we were about the same age. Right. Yeah. Well, happy birthday. Cause it hasn't been that yeah. many weeks yet this year. So you've had to have, <laughs> have had to have had it soon. Yeah. Are there certain foods that fuel re athletic recovery from working yeah. out and stuff? Well, yeah. So the first thing that I focus on off to a training session, um, you know, I'm training about 20 hours a week right now for, for an Ironman that's coming up. Um, the, the first th thing that I focus on is rehydration. Um, so that's critically important. It's really difficult uh, during a, you know, during a long ride to get enough, uh, fluid into you, you know, you are probably sweating out more fluid than you can get in. Um, so rehydration is, is critically important post-exercise, uh, post-exercise again, having, having some sort of carbohydrate rich foods, uh, because the glycogen replenishment is biphasic. And so in the first hour post-exercise, is when it's really sucking up those, you know, those sugars and converting into glycogen and storing that glycogen in the muscles. And so particularly when you're doing multiple workouts a day, <clears throat> um, if you don't have a lot of time between workouts, a lot of heavy workouts, um, then, then getting something in, usually for me, it's a smoothie. Um, so I feel like I'm getting the carbohydrates. Um, I'm get, I am getting a little bit of protein with that, but also a lot of the antioxidants and the fruits and the berries and the, the, the anti-inflammatory foods. Um, and so that's really what I focus on immediately post-workout is, is kind of the smoothie. Uh, it's quick. It's easy. You don't always feel like eating, you know, <laughs> so sometimes drinking is, is a little bit easier. It's weird because for some people, ap uh, working out kills their appetite and other people, it seems to fuel it. Yeah, yeah, that's a big subject of, of research as well in terms of uh, does it stimulate appetite or does it does it suppress it? Um, but it can suppress it, I think, immediately post-exercise, but then some hours later, it kind of catches up to you. Yeah, it can stimulate for sure. Yeah. You, you said you're doing an Ironman. When is it? Where is it? And what is it? And how many of these have you done so far? Oh, <laughs> Uh, so it's, it, it was one that, you know, we had signed up for one last year or in COVID hit. So this is uh, a, a postponement, uh, but it's end of May in Tulsa. So it's the Tulsa Ironman. It's the national U S championships for Ironman. Um, yeah. So my husband and I are doing it together. Yeah. So, so what is, you know, I had Ruth Heydrich on this week. I today's, it just seems to be athlete week. What, what exactly is an Ironman? Like, what do you have to do? Yeah, so it's a 2.4 mile swim. Uh, then you bike for 112 miles and then you get off the bike and run a marathon. Uh, so it's, it's a long day um, and it, it takes a lot of training and preparation. Uh, sometimes I think training for it is, is harder than actually doing it. But uh, I, you know, I'm not, it's not my favorite race distance. I'm, I'm more of an off-road athlete. I do mountain biking, um, off-road uh, triathlons, um, 
And, uh, but my husband wanted to do this. So I, I agreed to sign on it. It's my, it'll be my fifth Ironman. Yep. Wow. How do you feel after that? Uh, tired, <laughs> a little tired, a little sore. Yeah. Um, yeah, it takes a while to recover, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a fun challenge. And now that I'm not working full time, I feel like I can, I can actually devote a little bit more training time to it. Whereas before I was working full time and trying to do an Ironman, which is, which is tough. When, when you're not training for an Ironman, what is your daily exercise and eating like when it's just a regular month, regular, <laughs> if there is such a thing, I'm always training for something. So in the winter I train for Nordic cross country ski racing, um, and then usually in the summer, it's usually mountain bike races, um, off-road trail runs or Ironmans or triathlons. Um, yeah. So usually I, you know, I swim, bike and run most weeks, uh, most days, um, usually two to three workouts a day. And, uh, about, like I said, right now I'm about 20, 18 to 22 hours a week of training. Um, so it's a, it, it's almost like a full-time job. <laughs> it can be. And uh, yeah, so I, you know, I eat, I get up, I eat uh, a whole grain cereal. Um, lots, you know, it's a mixture of different grains, um, some fruit. sometimes then maybe I'll do a workout, then I'll do a smoothie uh, for lunch. Um, whatever's left over from the night before. Uh, for dinner, it's usually potatoes, burritos, beans, rice, uh, salad, stir fry, lots of greens. Uh, greens are like, greens are a performance enhancer, right? And uh, they, they improve um, blood flow, they improve uh, nitric oxide release. They've actually been shown to be an ergogenic aid for athletes. Um, so greens are something that I really try to focus on a lot. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's uh, that, that's kind of a typical day. <laughs> Yeah. Do you ever test your nitric oxide? I didn't even know you could, but Dr. Hydrix on Monday said she buys these strips where she tests hers. Oh, really? No, I, I have never done that. So that I would never, be interesting. Yeah, yeah. I never heard of that. Yeah. So why are carbohydrates the best friend of an athlete? And I think the best friend of anybody that's eating personally. <laughs> right. Um, so, the, you know, when you look at substrates for energy that give energy for, for, for exercise and muscular work, so fat is definitely a, an important substrate. And we have a lot of it. Um, and so we could fuel, you know, hours and hours of exercise by burning fat, because even for people that are pretty lean, that's a really calorie energy dense source of, of, of calories. Um, the problem with burning fat as a fuel, A, it takes more oxygen, like I mentioned, and B, it's slow, right? So the rate of, of its ability to provide energy is really slow. Um, and so it's good for like, you know, if you're going out and running hundred miles or you're doing an ultra distance type event, um, that's where you want fat to, to play a bigger role. Uh, but most people are doing short 10 Ks, five Ks, marathons. Um, and so that's where glycogen is so important because it's, it's power, it, it has a higher ability, of, a, a faster ability to provide calories or provide energy, right? So it's, it's, it's fast. Um, so the capacity is low, but the power is high. Um, so if I'm doing anything above 70% 70, 70 of my max, it's mostly relying on, on glycogen and, and carbohydrates. And so that's why it's such a key thing and um, so critical for perfor perfor performance, yeah. Did you always have a fit way of being in life or did you, cause I find that like, I was very late to the party with exercise. I was actually 51 years old, but had, it, I, there are people that just seem to have that exercise bug. They were bitten by it earlier and other people where it wasn't really modeled for us. And we kind of got away with it, not do it. We don't really get away with it because your body's always looking, but you, you know what I'm trying to say. There's just these super fit people and there's these people that just resist exercise. <laughs> Yeah, um, I've always been very active as a kid growing up. Um, I didn't really participate in, in any kind of structured sport, sports or anything like that until I got to um, college um, and I joined a running club in college and ran, a, I think I ran a 7K and was hooked, completely hooked at that point. 
And so I decided, oh, I need to run a marathon. So I did that. And then I read about this race in Hawaii called the Hawaiian Ironman. And back then, this was in 1980, early 1980s. Um, and so I didn't know how to swim at the time. I didn't really bike at the time. I just started running. Um, so I thought, I want to do an Ironman. And um, so I signed up for the Canadian Ironman um, in 1987 and um, found out that I just sort of had a little bit of a natural talent for it. Um, it you know, I, I did pretty well. I was fourth woman overall at the Canadian Ironman. So I qualified to go to Hawaii in the next year. So I, I did the Hawaiian one in 1988. And um, at the time I swore I'd never do an, another Ironman. <laughs> And then ended up doing one more, you know, doing more recently. But um, that kind of, I'm, I'm a little bit of an addict. I, I'll admit um, to, to exercise and training. And, and I, I just, it's, it's my drug, I guess. Wow. Well, what happens if, God forbid, you get injured? Or has that ever not, has that not happened? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, knock on wood, I'm being very fortunate from the injury perspective, other than crashes or, you know, I have broken a few bones crashing. But overuse injuries, almost non-existent. Um, so I feel very fortunate from that perspective. Um, but yeah, I, I do something like, uh, you know, if I can't run, I'll get in the pool. Um, and that, and I think that's the beauty of, of doing multi-sports, right? So um, if your shoulder is injured, then you can, you can run. If your foot is injured, you can get in the pool. <laughs> so, I know, but what do I do? I got a shoulder injury here and a knee injury there. And it's like, the only thing I've been able to do oh. is, spin, is spin and walk. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, this, yeah. So you have the slightest accent when you say words like fast. Are you from somewhere else? I'm originally from Southern Africa. Wow. That's where else. Is that like near Zimbabwe? Um, yeah. I was born in Zimbabwe. My parents were South African. Um, and then we uh, immigrated in the early seventies to Canada. So there's some Canadian influence as well. Yeah, right. Because the speedy vegan Elspeth has been on the show many times is watching and she has a, she, uh, her accent is a little bit like yours. So very, yeah, it's very nice. So we have some nice comments from the viewers. Let's see. And Nataria says, I'm loving this woman. I think I'll increase my daily exercise. Uh, Kimberly says, Sharon is so brilliant. I'm looking forward to her book. Yeah. When the book comes out, let me know. We'll have you on again. And oh, we, can, absolutely. we can definitely promote it. I love seeing people that are fit at any age and especially at, you know, at my age, because it's just, to me, it's very, very inspiring. It, so your husband, was he always an, an athlete as well? Yeah, we actually met. Um, he was a big cyclist on the road and that's, and that's how we met was through cycling and uh, yeah, so he then got into running and triathlons as well. Yeah. Nice. So he's, it's fun. You know, it's fun because uh, we can do this together. Yeah. And, uh, so that, that, that makes it more enjoyable. Uh, I wish I had two spin bikes because both my husband and I use it an hour a day, but we, oh. we only have one. So we, we kind of <laughs> have to take turns, you know, <laughs> but that would be fun. Like, you know, they have bicycle built for two. Somebody should make a spin bike built for two. There you, you know? go. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Lulu, who's watching live says, what does Sharon use for nutrition on the bike leg of the Ironman? What does she use for nutrition on the run leg? And does she use supplements like I don't know what this is, tailwind, GUs, or blocks. I don't, I'm sorry, oh. I'm not an athlete, so I don't know what those <laughs> words are. Yeah, so um, that taking in carbohydrate during the race is critically important. Um, there's some, and, and typically the, the research shows the more that you're able to ingest during the event, the better. Um, so I, I, I think... You know, I do use the goos, I do use the gels. So the, these are very simple carbohydrates, very digestible, very quick energy. I usually use a mix. I try to use a mix of food, real food, and some of the, uh, the athletic, more processed food. Um, when I, I did a, a few years ago, I did a hundred mile run up in Leadville. And uh, during the run, um, all I ate was real food. So depending on the intensity level of the exercise is going to depend on how, you know, if I use more real food versus um, more processed, um, quick energy types of things like goose and, and, and blocks. But uh, I use it, I, I do use it both because those are convenient. And uh, it, you, you, yeah, you, the, more, the more you can take in, the better do, during exercise. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 
Do they taste good? No, <laughs> <laughs> not my favorite. No. Nope. Wow. Yeah. No, Somebody they're, should invent a good sweet. tasting one. No, um, so no. Donald says, how do you know if you are burning fat and is there a way to ensure you are burning fat? Mm. Um, the best way to, to, to assess that is to go to a lab and um, they put a, a mask on your face and they measure your gas. It's called gas exchange. Um, and so you can do that as a steady state. So you get on and run at the same pace. They look at your gases that you're expelling versus taking in. And from that, they can get an estimate of how much fat you're burning and how much sugar you're burning. Um, now, typically at high intensity exercise, like I said, fat really doesn't contribute much. Um, carbohydrate is, is the, the preferred fuel of choice. Um, but if you're doing longer distance stuff, then you want a certain percentage of that to, to come from, from fat. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the only way that I know that you can really directly assess it. Yeah. But it's possible to be a, an athlete on a low fat diet, right? Cause Dr. Hydrix is. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, we don't need to eat fat to burn fat. <laughs> We, uh, we have enough of it and just, you know, just by training. So the training adaptations that come with endurance training, just increase our ability to, to burn fat because we increase the number of mitochondria within the muscle. So these are the mitochondria is where, you know, that conversion of substrates takes place from fat to ATP or adenosine triphosphate, which is the energy currency of the body. Um, and so one of the adaptations that occurs with endurance training is that you increase the number or the concentration of these mitochondria within the muscle. You also increase the size of the mitochondria. Um, and so just by virtue of training, um, you increase your ability to burn uh, and use fat as a fuel. Um, and, and, and so I don't think you need to eat a high fat diet to to, to be able to um, train yourself to increase that. Yep. Terrific. So yeah. there's a question from Wally. What do you think of beet juice? And also there's this product that I know some people use called beet boost. Have you ever heard of it? Um, yeah, I use, I do drink beet juice before an event or leading up to an event. Um, so what it show, what it does is a couple of things. Um, it allows you to do the same amount of work for less oxygen, okay? Um, and so it's a small benefit, uh, but you know, if you're looking for marginal improvements, um, that would be one way to go. Now, the, the research on that sh tends to show that if you're not an elite athlete, you're probably gonna benefit more from doing the beet juice, or the high nitrate leafy greens. So arugula, for example, has way more nitrate than beets, uh, but drinking the juice is just more convenient. Um, so the, the data is less clear on elite athletes. Um, it's a little bit more clear on, you know, just age group athletes like ourselves, uh, where that can be beneficial uh, to performance. But yeah, I, I definitely have used those uh, products and will continue to use those products. Have you ever heard of Beet Boost itself? This one product that I've tried, it tastes pretty good. It's just beets and cherries. Um, is, does it come in a can? It, it comes in like a plastic white container. And is it a powder? It's a powder. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all that stuff is designed to, to be good. Uh -huh. And the cherry, you know, the, the cherry juice as well. I mean, that that uh, is is uh, has been shown to reduce muscle soreness and delayed onset muscle soreness and I can speak from a personal experience in terms of the benefits of, of that tart cherry juice as well. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So there's a conversation happening in the chat. I don't know if you can see the chat about cooked greens versus raw greens, which is more beneficial. People have thyroid. So I'm, I'm assuming in your smoothies, you're, they're raw. The greens yeah. are raw. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Okay. Let's see what else we've got going on in the chat. Um, Let's see. Well, this is okay. This is interesting from Catherine. How does Sharon look after her joint health without relying on seafood? If she's vegan, I've never heard of eating seafood for joint health. I haven't either. Um, although the only thing 
possibly would be the omega-3s in seafood that can reduce inflammation. Um, but I think that unfortunately seafood comes with preformed arachidonic acid. So I'm not sure that there's a net gain there because preformed arach arachidonic acid tends to promote inflammation. Um, but uh, yeah, I actually have a chapter in my book on joint health and um, some of the research and some of the data on joint health and antioxidants, as it turns out, are critically important for the health of our joints um, and reducing inflammation within the joints. So um, I used to have, you know, back before I turned, went plant-based, um, you know, I'd mountain bike race all summer. And then in the winter, I'd start to run and I'd go out and run and my knees would just be aching and sore. And it would take like a few weeks to kind of get back into the running thing. And then um, again, after I switched my diet, that pretty much went, went away. And um, I don't tend to have joint issues at all, really, which is nice. Yeah. Nice. And also you keep, you, you're, you know, it sounds like you've never really struggled with weight and that, that seems to be a big issue with people with joint problems sure. is, is the yeah. excess weight that's on the body. Yep. Yeah. 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 Okay. That can contribute. Yep. Nice. So your fellow South African watching Elspeth says, have you ever run the comrades marathon in South Africa? <laughs> uh, no. Um, it's something I've thought about. Um, and maybe one day, but no, I haven't, unfortunately. That's a, that's an ultra marathon. I used to live in Durban actually, which is, which is where the race starts sometimes and where it finishes. Um, I, I'd love to know if she's done it. Um, I know my cousin, I have a cousin who's also plant-based and he's done it like 10 times or 12 times, I think. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit behind on that. So I need to get on that. Yes. Yes. Catherine, uh, Sharon is vegan. And, and what year did you go vegan? Uh, it was gosh, I want to say 22 years ago now. Yep. Wow. Yep. Terrific. And Wally says, what about these vegan bodybuilders who eat 250 grams of protein a day? Cause I was actually, it's funny that Wally posted that. Cause my next question was, do athletes need more protein or, uh, or is the vegan diet adequate for all athletes? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. And it, yes, the answer is yes. Um, so for endurance athletes, you know, we are constantly creating uh, increased blood supply, we're increasing our mitochondria. So we need proteins for that. Um, but again, not because we eat more calories, uh, we tend to, you know, let's say, you know, the, the recommendation is it, for, for endurance athletes is around uh, 1.2 grams per kilo of muscle, ma of muscle mass or weight mass. Um, so because we just eat more calories in general, we tend to get enough protein just from eating more calories. So the relative contribution might still be 10%, uh, but 10% of 2000 calories is more protein than 10% of 1500 calories, if that makes sense. Now for bodybuilders, that's, that's a little different. Um, and there's some interesting stuff around protein for bodybuilders and what they call uh, muscle protein synthesis. And that's their goal, right? They just wanna get bigger and bigger muscles. And in some ways it's a little abnormal what they do uh, because their muscles are just sort of abnormally large compared to most people. Um, and so the, 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 the amino acid of it, that's been studied in particular is, is leucine, the branch chain amino acid. So it's an essential amino acid. And so there's a little bit of a um, kind of, um, so, so what leucine does is trigger mTOR, right? So if you know mTOR, if you're familiar with that research, that accelerates aging. So when we eat high protein diets, we tend to increase production of mTOR and we tend to age more quickly. It's called the, you know, it's like putting on the accelerator for aging. So um, mTOR is, is critically important for muscle protein synthesis. So it's a little bit of a catch 22, um, but, it's, it's, it's like a flipping a switch, right? So if we can get the minimum amount of leucine, which is very easy to do on a plant-based diet. Um, so tofu, a serving of tofu has about, you know, 1.2 grams of leucine. We need about 1.8 grams of leucine to be able to flip the switch. And that's all we need to do. We don't need to eat, you know, above and beyond that, it's not, it's not that critical. 
Um, so it's pretty easy to achieve um, even from bodybuilders, but their protein needs are probably more around 1.8 to 2 gram, 2.0 grams per kilo. Um, so it, it is more than an endurance athletes for sure. Um, but they need carbohydrates too, because they burn through carbohydrates when they do their workouts. And, and unfortunately that's, um, uh, not, <laughs> not realized, I think often, I, hopefully I answered that question. It got a little bit complicated. So sorry if it got a little bit comp complicated, but oh, that's quite all right. So uh, Elspeth said that she, I saw her, uh, answer a minute ago. Oh. Hold on. She said, I'm Zimbabwean, but went to high school in Durban, never done the comrades marathon, but it's always been a dream. I can't run anymore because of knee issues, but I'm a happy walker. Okay. So here's a, you know, it's funny because whenever I have a guest that I don't know on, I prepare by reading as much as I can. If they have a book, I read the book, or in your case, I watch your YouTubes, but I got to say that my audience writes the best questions live on the spot. So Nancy says, when consulting with elite athletes and executives, how were their mindsets towards health and exercise different? And what was similar? Great question, Nancy. Thank you. Oh, that is a good question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it is a little bit different. You know, I think the executives are concerned about energy. Uh, they're concerned about um, resilience. Um, they're concerned about stress and sleep and to a degree, long-term chronic conditions like heart attacks. Um, so, you know, and part of the, part of the approach that I also take with executives is around brain function and cognitive function and how important diet is in terms of, uh, being able to think, think well and, and, and think clearly and, and make smart decisions. Um, you know, athletes are a little bit different breed because oftentimes they justify their poor diet by the volume of exercise that they do. And so they, they think that because they're lean or they're not overweight or because they run 20 miles and run marathons, oh, I can eat as much ice cream, I can eat the burgers, I can eat the fries, I can eat the chips. And, you know, on some level, yeah, exercise can be protective. Um, it can save you for a while, uh, but sooner or later, it's going to catch up. And there's some interesting re data looking at older runners, like men in their 60s and the 70s, and they actually found that they had more plaque in their arteries than non-runners of the same age. Um, and so you, you do kind of wonder why, why would that be? And is it because perhaps they're, again, sort of justifying their eating habits uh, they eat more and they eat more bad food. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I think I, that's what I would see as the, as the main difference uh, in terms of executives and athletes. Although, you know, athletes are also interested in performance, uh, but particularly age group athletes, not elite athletes, but age group athletes sometimes justify <laughs> their, their poor dietary habits. <laughs> I used to. <laughs> I used to justify my ice cream habit because I ran 20 miles. Uh, that, actually, I remember uh, Katie May, who I've had on the show, used to, that's one, one point of her life. That's all she did was run and eat ice cream. <laughs> Just <laughs> That's neat. Well, uh, people are really excited about your new book. They can't wait to read it. So what would you, what would you like to leave people with? What would you like them to know? And where would you like them to follow you if they'd like to be more interactive with you? Oh, well, thanks for asking that. Um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, I, I think diet is, is key for many, many things. Uh, you know, I <clears throat> certainly got interested in it from a, from a health and, and reducing risk for chronic conditions without realizing that the potential it has for improving performance as I age. Um, and I think it's really, I think it's really made a difference, you know, being competitive at the age of 61. Um, I'm, I'm often, you know, the top three, women overall at a race, um, still beating a lot of younger athletes. So I feel like that's in, in, in large part to um, consistently eating a healthy diet. And it really is consistency over time, just like anything. Um, and yeah, so like I said, I just launched the YouTube channel a couple of, a few months ago. Um, and certainly you can, re you can, you can connect with that. Um, I do have a website 
um, if people want to reach out with specific questions, there's a way to contact me on the website. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for being vegan and for uh, showing what a healthy vegan in their 60s can look like. I really appreciate yep. that. Yeah. Jennifer says she's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. It was so nice to meet you. And well, I can't, really, I can't wait for that book to come out because we, we people are saying that Robert Cheek is writing a new book of the plant. I think it's called The Plant fuel maybe it's called the plant-based athlete you were saying maybe plant fuel but you know it'd be nice to have one for the women's perspective see if somebody just said uh, sharon you look great both chef aj and sharon's skin looks so nice did you really say you were 61 i yep <laughs> it, it comes as a shock to me as well trust me <laughs> yeah. no you have like no ring yeah you're you do you yeah i don't see a single line or wrinkle on your face yeah, yeah. well thank you yeah it's uh I feel young and hopefully I look young as well. Yep. You absolutely do. Yep. You look amazing. And speaking of people that look amazing, tomorrow's show is Dr. Jessica Krant, who not only looks amazing, but is a board certified dermatologist, can help us mm -hmm. look more amazing with a plant-based diet and other suggestions. So make sure you get those questions in in advance because whenever we have a doctor on, it's just crazy. Thanks so much, Sharon. Take care. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thanks very much. See you.